KCHR is delighted to welcome all of you to the first public program of 2022. Uh, we have with us Professor Omila Thapa, our discussants, Dr. John Thomas and Dr. Simona Sonny. And uh, before we begin the program, let me make a few start of the program announcements. I request all of you to please keep your microphones on mute uh, for the duration of the program. We will first have the discussions, um, we'll have the presentations. And if you have any queries or responses, I request you to please type that in the chat box. We will be able to read out a three to five uh, queries or responses depending on the time frame. And after the, at the end of the presentations, Professor Thapa will respond to the discussions and to the responses. Um, so I request Professor Alina to please uh, take forward the proceedings. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I echo uh, Dr. Rachel Varghese in saying that we are so excited and delighted to start 2022 uh, with a discussion of um, Professor Romila Thapa's latest book, which came out last year, The uh, Voices of Dissent, an essay. Um, um, Romila Thapa is one of the people about whom one can easily say she really doesn't need any introduction. She is one of India's preeminent and one of the most prolific historians. And most of us here uh, have studied, read, or and engaged with her work over the past many decades. So from Ashoka and the decline of the Mauryas in 1961 to Voices of Dissent and Essay in 2021, uh, Romila has published more than 20 books on different aspects of social and cultural history of ancient India, of which some like Shakuntala, the Aryan or Somanatha use specific textual or historical themes as their entry point and others like from lineage to state or the past before us explore wider structures of power and modes of intellection and writing. Voices of Dissent is a meditation on the forms and idioms of dissent across millennia. We are excited to be able to open up a discussion of this very timely work and invite two scholars whose close reading of literary and historical traditions constitute very important contributions to Indian social scientific scholarship. Let me briefly introduce our discussions for today. The first speaker is Simona Sani, uh, who comes from the field of uh, interdisciplinary literary studies. Uh, she teaches at the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Delhi, and her areas of interest include the fate of democracy, a challenge of equality and theoretical engagements with various forms of violence. Her book, The Modernity of Sanskrit, which came out in 2009 from the University of Minnesota, is a really important and very nuanced reading of the ways in which one can think about uh, the travel of uh, both language and text uh, across different kinds of contexts. More recently, she translated Yashpal's first novel, Dada Comrade, which has just been published by Penguin. John Thomas uh, comes from the field of history and he teaches in the Department of uh, Humanities and Social Sciences at the IIT in Guwahati. And after I had invited both of them to uh, be interlocutors in this discussion, I realized that they were both from IIT and that wasn't deliberate. Uh, so I must hastily add that John's PhD is from JNU. Uh, uh, Simona's is from the University of California, Irvine. Uh, his areas of interest include the history of Christianity and engagements with the ideas of nationalism. His book, Evangel Evangelizing the Nation, Religion and the Formation of Naga Political Identity, came out in 2016 from Rutledge. And uh, from my own personal perspective and that of many others, I hope his book on Kerala Christianity will also come out soon. So could we start the discussions uh, now uh, with uh, Simona going first? Uh, both speakers have 25 minutes each. Um, Rachel will remind you when you have five minutes left. Simona. Oh, am I? Sorry. Now you are. Am I unmuted? Yes. Yeah, okay, sorry, okay. 
Um, let me start by thanking my friend and colleague, Professor G. Arunima, um, as well as Dr. Fascia and the Kerala Council for Historical Research for arranging this event. I am superlatively honored to talk about Professor Thapar's work today. Like some of you present here, I'm old enough to say that I've been reading her work for decades. Indeed, it has been formative and extremely significant for my own interest in Sanskrit texts and in early India. Towards the end of an essay originally written in 1980 about the contribution of Didi Kosambi to Indology, Professor Thapa writes about his role as a historian, drawing on comments made by E.H. Carr. It is difficult to read those words today without noticing how well they describe, indeed, her own work through the past few decades. Let me cite that passage, which I first read in the volume Interpreting Early India. And I quote, above all, he, Kosambi, was concerned with the contemporary relevance of his understanding of the past. But he insisted that the relevance was never to serve any doctrinaire purpose. Rather, it should stem from what he thought was the natural function of the historian. E.H. Carr writes, the function of the historian is neither to love the past nor to emancipate himself from the past, but to master and understand it as the key to the understanding of the present. Great history is written when the historian's vision of the past is illuminated by insight into the problems of the present." End quote. It has been evident for a long time that questions stemming from the present have guided Professor Thapar's interest in the past, but that link becomes strikingly evident in the short book we are discussing today, an essay titled Voices of Dissent and published in 2020. In paying attention to voices of dissent, and the text is indeed interested in voice, articulation, the audible and the inaudible, the text is also positioned from the very beginning as itself an articulation of dissent. In writing about these other voices, it also appears to align itself with them, simply by drawing attention to this long tradition. For Professor Thapert's framing argument is directed primarily against those who wish either to cover over dissent or to eviscerate it by calling it foreign, un-Indian, or anti-national. Hence, the first part of the argument is simply to demonstrate her argument that hegemony has never been complete and that from a very early time, dominant ideas about religion and society have been contested and questioned in India. In framing this argument, Professor Thapar employs the categories of self and other, where the self always represents the dominant view and the other, the questioning or dissenting view. I will discuss this frame in some more detail later in my remarks, but for now, I want to simply point towards what I take to be the salient, the salient arguments of the essay. So I'm going to simply sketch out um, what I take the essay to be doing, and then make a few observations. In the first part of her essay, Professor Thapar builds her argument on the basis of three examples. First, the relation between the Aryas and the Dasas in early India, as this is put to the test by the paradoxical and very interesting category of the Dasi Putra Brahman. Second, the rise of the different Shramana movements, and by these, um, She's referring to the Buddhists, the Jains, the Ajivikas, sometimes the Charvakas as well. Um, similar in, the, so they're all distinct, but they are similar in their questioning of the Vedic Dharma. And third, the relation between what we today know of only as Islam and Hinduism in the early modern age, um, a relation that she discusses. So the relation between these two uh, Islam and Hinduism, um, but these are categories that become monolithic at a certain moment in history. And this is a relation that she discusses not only in terms of the emergence of Bhakti and Sufi traditions, but also in terms of the relation between Mughals and Rajputs in that period. 
One of the most interesting observations Professor Thapar makes in this discussion is to suggest that while on the one hand, in the history of ancient and early modern India, dissenting voices obviously questioned and opposed dominant ideas, on the other, they also functioned as ways of containing revolt. Here she is interested in thinking about the intriguing question, why did dissent so rarely turn into revolt? That is to say, into a more active and perhaps violent means of performing opposition. As I understand it, her argument works on two related levels. She suggests first that significant in the containment of dissent was the way it was received. Indeed, from the very first pages, she clarifies that her interest is not only in exhibiting these moments of dissent, but in thinking about how its reception changes from one period to another. In early India, she suggests, dissent may have been countered at least partly by assimilation. So I'm going to um, cite uh, an interesting and important passage here. Um, and I quote, curiously, despite all these changes and challenges to existing norms, there seems to have been some hesitation in dissent turning into revolt. Dissent was perhaps a way of containing it. The awareness of the possibility of revolt was known but discouraged. Caste rules could be quietly reformulated as long as no questions were asked or if people could get away with it. New deities and rituals were incorporated into the formal religions and occasionally new teaching hinting at a different kind of society could be spoken of among some people. This has been an ongoing process through the centuries and explains the acceptance of interpolations into texts such as the Mahabharata, Ramayana, and Gita. Through these interpolations, the texts were, as it were, living with the times, end quote. Am I perfectly clear or should I wear headphones? You're, you're perfectly clear. Okay, great, thanks. Though she does not say so explicitly, it seemed to me as I read this passage in the context of the essay, that Professor Thapar is perhaps voicing a lament here, or if that seems too intense, then at least a complaint about the contemporary fading of such means of assimilating dissent. For it is clear that in her argument, the assimilation of assent by dominant ideologies is presented as a desirable move. It is that which pushes and hence enables dominant ideas and even texts to be reformulated, rewritten, and reframed. As she says a little later in the essay, and I quote again, to ignore the contribution of dissenting ideas to these reformulations is to ignore the impressive presence of dissent in assessing the cultivation of religion in India and in the underpinning of many social forms, end quote. At the second level, the argument works by suggesting that this kind of adaptability or mutability that becomes legible in the accommodation of dissent may also speak to the ethos of nonviolence. For the question of violence runs like a constant thread through the essay, though it only surfaces in a more vivid color later once Professor Thapar moves to the modern period and a discussion of Gandhi's Satyagraha. Now it becomes clear, so towards the end it becomes clear that she's drawing a line from the Shramanic renouncers to the Sufi Bhakti poets to Gandhi, a line that focuses on the way in which all these figures combine an emphasis on renunciation with an emphasis on nonviolence on questioning political authority and on inclusivity. In fact, one of the strongest arguments of the book indeed concerns violence. It claims that whereas political power might be predicated on violence, moral authority on the contrary erodes precisely to the extent that it seems associated with violence. So political authority depends on violence, but moral authority must distance itself from violence. 
In the latter part of the essay, Professor Thapar seems almost close to an Arendtian position, the position of Hannah Arendt. For example, when describing the Satyagrahi's retreat from violence, she writes, and I quote, violence does not persuade, it replaces persuasion by fear and terror, end quote. At such moments, it becomes quite evident that this is not only an interpretative or descriptive argument based on her readings of these exemplary moments of Indian history, but also a passionate plea for a culture of persuasion and simultaneously a strong criticism of the contemporary widespread fascination with and indeed celebration of violence in the public sphere. One of the interventions of this text then is to say that a long tradition of claiming and receiving moral authority by abjuring violence and placing oneself in a certain externality to the prevalent social structure, albeit a kind of internal externality as the renouncer um, has, is under threat today. It is not dead for sure and the protests against the CAA especially those staged in Shaheen Bagh, are for Professor Thapar eloquent testimony to the survival of this tradition. But nevertheless, the threat, as we all know, is serious and dangerous. While colonial epistemology and, and the majoritarianism that a, democrat, that a democratic system breeds are certainly discussed in the essay, a significant reason for this eclipse, the eclipse of this mode of um, conjoining dissent with nonviolence and moral authority. Um, so the eclipse of the visibility, audibility, and power of dissent, according to the text, is the modern monolithic view of religion. Hence, Professor Thapar writes, and I quote again, it is because of the absence of emphasizing the monolithic and the uniform in religion that dissent took the form that it did and to some extent continues to do, end quote. In this vein, she constantly draws our attention to the importance of the sect, the sect as a group and an idea which is not part, which is different from um, the idea of a monolithic religion. So the importance of the sect for giving the believer both a sense of community and a sense of identity. In both early and pre-modern India, it is the sect as a category that opens up the possibility of plurality and dissent and not the overarching umbrella of Hinduism or Islam. Although this is by no means a sufficient overview of this immensely wide ranging essay, both scholarly and polemical, let me now turn to some of the questions that arose for me in reading it. Since time is short, I will limit myself to two broad but related questions. First, the framing categories of the self and the other. As they are discussed in this text, they carry, I think, both a descriptive and a paradigmatic charge. The category of the self refers in the text to those who are in authority at a certain juncture. It is the name of the dominant and the other is the name of the group or figure that questions. As Professor Thapar writes, it happens at times that these exchange places and the erstwhile other becomes the self. The very possibility of this interchangeability, however, alerts us to something that the text briefly mentions when it discusses a different kind of otherness, one that does not originate in dissent, but is instead imposed. This is the otherness imposed upon those at the very bottom of the caste hierarchy. Although at times this imposition was contested, it was often, she writes, too oppressive to even allow for, to even have room for dissent. This example shows us that the concept of dissent perhaps itself presumes first, a certain level of equality, and second, a level of what one might call civility. My question then is, by writing about dissent in such a way that it refers to the other, the other who is in some ways at least like or equal to the self, 
do we risk consolidating the self as the self? That is to say, consolidating the claim of the powerful to be the self or to present themselves as the self. In this context, um, I wonder if I could request Professor Thapar to comment upon the alternative histories of early India written by Ambedkar in so many different texts. In these histories, it seems the approach to self and other is a little different. It is the Shudras and the untouchables who become the selves, even when it is precisely their oppression that is being described. This is evident from the very terms that Ambedkar uses, for example, revolution and counter revolution in ancient India, where revolution refers to the Buddhist revolution and the ascent of the Mauryas and counter revolution to the violent overthrow of the Mauryas and the consolidation of Brahminical power. I would be interested in hearing Professor Thapar's views, not only about the historical claims of Ambedkar's texts, but also about his approach, if she has any thoughts about this, an approach that reads the history of India as a history of war, of defeat, subjugation, and humiliation, rather than a history of disagreement and dissent. My second question has to do with the very intriguing and complex concept of renunciation. The renouncer, as Professor Thapar describes him, and he is a predominantly male figure, is not an ascetic, but rather someone who is at once part of society and yet distanced from it. He is not a revolutionary, but is nevertheless invested in foundational change. He is interested in counterculture, not in revolt. I wonder if Professor Thapar could say something more about her interest in this figure, an interest that I know goes back several years, and tell us why she thinks this figure might be significant for us today. I'm asking this question partly because while reading this book, I was reminded of a book by Amartya Sen that makes some somewhat similar arguments, the argumentative Indian. One important difference, however, it seemed to me, um, and this is just a very quick impression, one important difference is that Sen, as far as I recall, does not accord so much significance to the figure of the renouncer. So I'm curious to hear more about the specificity of this figure, and in particular, it's um, what, what it might uh, the promise that it might hold for us today, if indeed it holds such a promise. Uh, another reason for putting some pressure on this question is that with the evocation of the renouncer, we are, it seems to me, in a very distinct historical political space, the space of the subcontinent. If one considers, for example, the work of another theorist who has written a great deal about disagreement, democracy, and the other, namely the French philosopher Jacques Rancière, we note that the staging of disagreement, in his case, he's, he's referring mostly to Europe, uh, the staging of disagreement takes a rather different form. To put it um, very uh, quickly and perhaps simplistically, for Rancière, what is important is the politicization of bare life quote unquote, life that has until now not been considered fit for political space. Hence, um, again, just to give a quick kind of example as a, as a bookmark, um, he gives the famous example of Olympe de Gouges, the woman who argued that since women could be sentenced to death as enemies of the French Revolution, they could also claim equal political rights. The renouncer, however, is not necessarily making a case, as I understand it, for entry into the space of the political as constituted, but almost a case for the relative insignificance of the political. He is bringing another discourse to act on the contemporary political discourse of the day. This brings me to my last question, one concerning religion. Most crudely put, 
I wonder if dissent as a category is always necessarily appropriate when talking about religion. It is certainly appropriate when we are discussing institutions and practices of religion. But surely religion does not only reside in its institutions and practices. In so far as religion evokes a divinity that is absolutely other, an unknowable and unapproachable other, it perhaps gives us a different way of framing the self-other relation, one in which the self, far from being authoritative, is always paltry, flawed, mortal, and finite, and constantly looks to the other for sustenance and grace. Is the renouncer significant for us because he or she stands for this other religiosity, this other way of conceiving the self and the other, one that has perhaps already vanished from our world. I will end here. Thank you, Simona. Thank you so much. Um, may I, um, Simona, can you hear me? Thank you. Yes, thank you. Yes. <laughs> All right. Uh, could I call upon John now, John Thomas, uh, so that we can go straight into John's presentation? Yeah. Thank you, Arunima. Uh, and I would also like to express my gratitude to the Kerala Council of, for Historical Research for inviting me to be part of this book discussion. Uh, it is indeed an honor as well as an extremely daunting task to discuss the book of a historian who one has grown up reading and been such an inspiration to numerous researchers like me who have been striving to master the various intricacies of the historian's craft. Even in the midst of all the unpleasant noises and whataboutry that goes on in our country, uh, Professor Thapa has always stood her ground and remained an indomitable voice of reason, always imploring us through her graceful yet firm words, the importance of the historian's craft and the many possibilities that it opens up towards understanding not only our past, but our own troubled times. The book, uh, Voices of Dissent, is not only a fine testament of this, but an indispensable reading for understanding the extent to which a past shaped by multiple instances of dissent, of contestations between established selves and non-conformist others, have a bearing on our own present day strivings for a democratic and just society. Dissent is not a recent phenomenon, as it is often made out to be. It is not a modern concept or a Western import that is presumably disrupting an otherwise pristine and harmonious whole. Rather, it has been integral to the history of the subcontinent, taking on varied forms across time and space, interacting with a range of contemporaneous ideas and practices and therein contributing to words what, towards the making of what is India today. This is further illustrated in the book through an examination of three instances of dissent that had occurred within the domain of religion in pre-modern India. Dissent of Dashiputra Brahmanas during the Vedic times, of the Shramanas during the early centuries of the common era, and of the Bhakti sons and Sufi peers in the 15th and 16th centuries, in opposition to what had come to be constituted in their own times as orthodox and established selves. In all these instances, dissent and responses to dissent were of varied degrees, layers, and forms, often contingent on the specific social context in which they came to be articulated. Yet, 
there were certain common threads that ran through all these instances, such as renunciation, institutionalizing dissent through the establishment of new sex, being imbued with an ethical purpose, exercising moral authority over other forms of power, etc. These common tropes, as the book illustrates, have also come to be evoked consciously or otherwise in the Gandhian movement, as well as some of the present day acts of dissent. In prioritizing acts of dissent that were religious in idiom, the book doesn't claim that religion was the only domain in which dissent had occurred. It is just that when it comes to pre-modern past, religion was the domain where dis dissent had a wide ranging impact on social life and where it was more obvious. With the emergence of nationalism and the formation of the nation state, with the idea of citizenship being put in place, this changed to some degree as possibilities had opened up for dissent to be expressed within the idiom of civil society as a means to ensure the protection and defense of citizenship rights. There are several pertinent and very interesting arguments that require serious considerations in the book, but it would neither be practical to discuss them all here and would not be possible given my own limited knowledge of the early past. Hence, I thought it would be far more meaningful to engage with three sets of assertions that are closer to my own preoccupation with the history of religion during the 19th and 20th centuries, especially in Northeastern and Southern India. First, the transformation of religion from being a disaggregated mosaic of belief systems and practices in pre-modern times to more consolidated and politicized identities in modern times and the implications that has on dissent. Second, the ethical purpose that underlay dissent in the past, especially in the domain of religion and their continued presence as cultural codes in modern times. Finally, the extent to which nationalism in our own times makes it possible or impossible for dissent to be expressed. Taking the first one, on the character of religion in the pre-modern past and its transformation in modern times, Professor Thapa reiterates an argument that she has more elaborately examined in some of her other writings. Personally speaking, this is an argument that has influenced and confirmed my own understanding of the transitions that have have occurred in the religious landscape of India. The argument is as follows, religion in pre-modern times was essentially a mosaic of various disaggregated sects with rather porous boundaries. As Professor Tapa says, religion was an assortment of juxtaposed sects of which most were marginally linked with, the, with existing ones and some were distant. Or, as she states in another essay, a mosaic of belief systems, some linked, others not. However, all this changed with colonial scholarship, and I would add with the spread of modern missionary movement initiated by Semitic faiths. Those religious sects that seemed similar came to be classified and consolidated under more rigidly defined labels, such as Hindu, Muslim, Christian, etc. This not only resulted in reclassification and reformulation of existing texts, beliefs, rituals, and identities, but also in the construction of histories that legitimated such rigid and consolidated re religious identities. In my own research on the tribal communities of Northeast India, what has become discernible in something similar is, is something similar, wherein in pre-modern times, beliefs and rituals tended to vary from village to village, place to place, 
so much so that it had left the colonial administrator eager to classify and categorize the religious landscape rather baffled and anxious. While there were similarities in the beliefs and practices across different villages and tribes, the deities, the myths, and the specificities of the ritual practices varied from place to place, indifferent to the logic of standardization. As the colonial anthropologist T.C. Hodson in his work on the Naga tribes of Manipur said, everything they make tends to variety. Everything is individual, thereby insisting on points of difference rather than uniformity. Of course, there were no formal religious sects that were formed, primarily because it was taken for granted that belief ought to be specific to a particular place and would be meaningless beyond that place. Yet in the light of the expansion of the neo vaishnavite movements from the 15th century onwards and the Christian missions from the 19th century onwards and the attempts of caste society to absorb tribal communities into its religious and social fold, the need for highly disaggregated set of tribal beliefs and practices to dissent, standardize, and recast into certain tribe-specific religions came to be stressed. What is most important in all this is, as Professor Thapa alludes to in her essay, the character of the pre-modern religious world had provided substantial space for accommodating dissent. To disagree, move away, and start an alternative sect was considered common. There was far more fluidity and it allowed a free play of belief, emotion, and inquiry, as she says. This is very much in contrast to what we observe in modern times where religion has been turned into enumerated, consolidated, anxious, and politicized identities. And transitioning from one to the other for any reason, or even having a divergent thought within a particular religion, seems to invite the ur of vigilantes and the state. It is also important to think about this, especially in today's context, where anti-conversion laws are being legislated across the country. The anxieties and assumptions that underlie such legislations certainly insist on certain fixity in relation to religious identity. Moving on to the second set of assertions. Through the examples of Shramana renouncers, Bhakti sons, Sufi peers, and bards such as Charan and Bhatt, Professor Tapa argues that there was a strong ethical content that underlay instances of dissent in the past both in idea as well as practice. They not only attempted to move away from the ways of the orthodoxy and the established religious selves, but to envisage and work towards an alternative society that would be compassionate, inclusive, and equal of a higher ethical plane. They did not expect this alternative society to emerge out of a violent social revolution, but through what Professor Thapa calls a process of osmosis, a process of gradually permeating existing society, persuading people and institutions through their work and ideas, and therein ensuring a steady transformation. This had a certain degree of acceptance among the populace at large, and it was not uncommon for them to invest renouncers, sons, peers, and bards with moral authority and legitimize their dissent to the extent where it was acceptable for them to question even the rulers of their times and their legitimacy to rule. Continuities with this dissenting tradition was evident in Gandhi's Satyagraha and most importantly, the popular response it elicited. The ethical posturing of Gandhi and the Satyagrahis in relation to ideas, practices, social relations, mode of struggle, and the alternative society that was envisioned seemed to echo the dissent of the renouncers. Moreover, the popular appeal of the Gandhian movement also seemed to point towards the continuing presence 
of a cultural code that had existed from before, one that recognized the moral authority of the renouncer. It is no wonder that colonial administration, unaware of the code, unaware of that code, remained aghast not only at the authority with which Gandhi dissented, but also at the large following he seemed to have. The ethical element that underlay the dissent of homini religiosi, those who were essentially religious, of which Gandhi was certainly one, was an important ingredient in shaping the anti-colonial movement in India. It urged nationalism of the time to think beyond mere immediate institutional or political goals and envisage an entirely new society. Scholarship on Gandhi and his own writings have revealed that for him, Swaraj was not mere political independence from the British, but something much broader, freedom from everything that enslaves humankind right down to the level of the individual, therein making it possible for one to govern his own self as a moral being. My own researches on the early ecumenical leaders among Indian Christians have also illustrated that their yearning was for a deeper ethical and social reconstruction of India, much in line with what Gandhi, Tagore, and others had articulated. In other words, theirs was a dissent imbued with a vision to establish, through a certain leavening process, an alternative society to one that exists, a society that would be inclusive, equal, and compassionate. For them, surely the ethical purpose was the pivot on which every aspect of social life ought to be organized. And dissent was an ethical imperative. Here, it is worth pondering to what extent is dissent informed by ethical purpose in today's times? Or has the logic of capital tamed us so much that we are unable to think of dissent in a more sustained manner beyond purely immediate goals or immediate gratification. Finally, turning to nationalism, how far does nationalism as a political form accommodate dissent? Professor Tapa argues that with nationalism, more specifically anti-colonial nationalism, coming to the fore of Indian political life, the relationship between the ruler and his praja came to be replaced by a new political relationship between the citizen who is endowed with rights guaranteed under a constitution and the state elected by the citizenry to protect those rights. Forging of this relationship opened up new possibilities and idioms of dissent as it allowed for the coming together of citizens who claimed equal status and rights within an independent nation state. Meanwhile, colonial construction of monolithic religious identities had simultaneously paved the way for religious nationalism. In contrast to anti-colonial or secular nationalism, religious nationalism catered to the interests of one particular religious identity in exclusion of other identity. And as Professor Tapa argues, such nationalism ceases to be nationalism at all and easily slides into majoritarianism and with it fascism. Nationalism, as for Professor Tapa, is an out to be about fostering an all inclusive identity. The nation state as a contract between the citizens and the state is bound by the ethical code that demands an open dialogue between the governed and the governing. And the function of dissent to be a moral force that would give people strength to assert their humanity. But given the history of nationalism and the post-colonial nation states, how far can this be expected? And this would be my question to you. When the nation state by its very nature is driven by a desire for homogeneity, is it possible for it to ever accommodate dissent and democratic sensibilities? While modern nation state ought to be bound by an ethical code, in a highly bureaucratized and impersonal system, 
do ethical considerations even matter? Even during its secular moment, in spite of the democratic promises it had made, the Indian nation state had struggled to be all inclusive, not to speak of the present predicament. The potent that Tagore had about nationalism almost a century back seemed to have only come true. Maybe this is being rather pessimistic on my part, maybe because it has to do with growing up, being reminded of my identity in a nation that has been systematically sliding into majoritarianism. Maybe it is also because of my closer awareness of the 20th century history of Northeast India, which is not very pleasant as far as the history of Indian nation state is concerned. Nevertheless, following up on the lead Professor Tapa has provided in relation to the character of religion in pre-modern past, which was highly disaggregated in form, which allowed space for dissent and divergence of thought and inquiry. Is it possible to envisage a more decentralized political life beyond the nation form that would to some extent pave the way for plurality of thought and being? The more nation state assume a centralized form, the more unwieldy it becomes to accommodate the difference and diversity that is India. I don't know if I was able to do justice to the task that Arunima had entrusted me with. Nevertheless, reading this book has been such an engaging and refreshing experience. Living in times when you have to prove the Indianness of all that you utter, speak, write, listen, teach, eat, dress, and whatnot, after reading this book, one should be able to confidently say that to dissent is very Indian thing to do. And one will continue to do that. Thank you, Professor Thapa, for writing this essay and for all that you have been to generations of students of history like myself. Thank you. Thank you so much, John. Um, we had at the beginning of the meeting said that we would uh, invite we would take about a maximum of three to five questions, but had requested you to type these in, into the chat box so that we could read them out. But I do not see any questions in the chat box, so I assume there aren't any questions. So may I invite uh, Professor Romila Thakur to now respond to the two discussants. Professor Thakur. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Aruna. Thank you to the Kerala Council for Historical Research and you and all of you involved in um, suggesting this meeting and in actually uh, working it out and um, having the event take place. Um, it's a very, very difficult thing to do. The two interventions have been so thought provoking that I really don't know where to begin and how to enter the discussion as it were. It's the it's kind of thing where I think, um, you know, if there were six or seven of us sitting around some coffee and talking about the book, it would be very, very much easier because one could flit from this to that to the other. Um, but let me try and suggest um, that it is possible to argue, uh, well, not argue, but to discuss uh, what, what I've said in a coherent fashion. Let me try and be coherent about my reaction uh, to your comments. Um, and really, thank you very much indeed for those comments, because um, one doesn't get this kind of reaction very frequently from a book that one writes. I mean, I have had some reaction, interesting, fascinating reaction to this book, but this has really been an, uh, extremely uh, illuminating for me. Uh, where do I begin? I'm, I'm really not, not very clear, uh, but let me see. 
Uh, one of the suggestions was that um, dissent does not dissent in the Indian tradition does not lead to violent revolt. It leads much more to assimilation and to what I in my own fashion have called a process of osmosis. Now, I think in part, this has to do a little bit with the structure of Indian society as well. I didn't go into this uh, in the book because in fact, it's a very major subject and it would have required another book much bigger than this little essay. Um, to see the connections. But I think it's about time that people did work on this. I mean, I, I, I'm surprised very often to, to find that um, something like Indian philosophy on the whole is discussed at a very rarefied level of thought. And it's very seldom a case of saying, what is the context of a particular theory of philosophy? What are the people involved, who are the people involved, and why are they involved, and does this have any connection with the kinds of thoughts that are coming up out of this, this tradition. Um, is this a lament, the, the question of dissent not leading to revolt? I think not, because I think, as I tried to show in the book, um, dissent is really a, as it were, the prehistory to protest and revolt. You have to begin with doubt and dissent first and work that out in great detail uh, in the form perhaps of questioning an existing system uh, before you come to actually saying that, right, we will now get up and physically protest. An intellectual protest is one thing, a physical protest is quite another thing. Um, my second point on this would be that in a sense, the kind of people that indulge in dissent and in an intellectual protest are rather different from the kind of people that indulge in a physical protest revolution. Uh, when I say they're rather different, what I mean is that in a sense, the, the perspective and the aspirations differ somewhat, up to a point, not entirely, up to a point. And the, a certain point comes where there is, I think, a divergence. And therefore, that aspect of it has also to be kept in mind. Um, there is certainly much more adaptability in a nonviolent approach, no question. And when you combine nonviolence with compassion and when you combine it with humaneness, um, the whole question of adaptability becomes very central in, 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 the, in the way in which you express yourself, your dissent and, and uh, your feelings. Um, and I agree that this is where moral authority is absolutely crucial. And I think I do try, perhaps not very successfully, to suggest that dissent is much more associated perhaps with moral authority uh, than is protests and revolution. The physical aspect very often um, overlooks, ignores, uh, sets aside issues of moral authority, whereas dissent in the way in which I've defined it would, would tend to keep at it all the time and keep invoking it all the time. Um, as, as we have seen in the figures of people like uh, Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, who are constantly talking uh, about the centrality of moral authority. Um, and they're, they're in politics. And, and you know, this is something which is so impressive that these are all people in politics. I mean, to talk to politicians today across the world about moral authority is like talking to a wall. Um, you really get no response because it seems to have gone out of existence. Um, and then I come back to the question of how does all this relate to the social order? 
I think one of our problems in discussing this in the Indian situation is that we as historians, anthropologists, sociologists, literary people haven't really taken into consideration more and more of the attitudes that prevailed amongst those that were in fact being victimized by the dominant. We've talked about the attitudes of the dominant and certain attitudes where the dominant has shown a concern for those that have been victimized. But we really haven't heard the voice of the victim sufficiently. And I think here, one of the problems is, of course, that we don't have the sources, the literary sources, and everybody sort of rushes to, to literature to, to, to find the sources. But I think oral traditions are important. And now there is a lot of work being done by historians on the methodology of oral traditions and how you sift oral traditions in terms of what is possibly authentic and what is not and so on. Um, so that I think there is a need to turn to that kind of source material much more and try and hear another voice that comes in. Um, you know, something other than the voice of the dominant speaking for those who are not dominant. We would like to have a little more on the voice of those who are not dominant speaking for themselves. And I think that that's something that perhaps historians will turn to. Um, The, the, the importance, and, and this is, yes, where, where the, the reference that was made to Ambedkar um, as a self. Yeah, that is that, you know, people whose voices we have not heard and therefore uh, we do not see them as the self. But once they start speaking to us, then we, perhaps we begin to see them as the self. And those voices then have their own structure of the self and the other. Uh, one of the things I do want to emphasize is that when one says um, that there is the predominance of the self, um, one is not talking about homogeneity because in every situation where there is a self and another, there is a continuation of the dichotomy of the self and the other on both sides, within the tradition of the self and within the tradition of the other. And in a sense, one of the, one of the connections that I was trying to make was that, for example, um, uh, the shamanistic tradition, which I think uh, begins as a dissenting tradition, really does end up as the self in many cases, historically, uh, in many parts of India. And, and this is an interesting process that how does this conversion take place? I didn't go into this in the book because it would really require a much deeper study. Uh, similarly with the bhakti tradition, which started as the voice of dissent in many cases, has now in many cases become the voice of the self. It's associated with the dominant. And you know, how often do you hear of the teachings of someone like Ravidas, for whom the utopia was the city without sorrow, Begampura? And what was the absence of sorrow due to? Uh, the absence of social inequality. And then when you go back to someone like that, and you say, well, what happened? He got converted into a teacher of whichever sectarian tradition it was that he belonged to. That social message, that message that he was giving other than the religious message, the purely religious message as we see it, that somehow doesn't get uh, brought out sufficiently. And I, I think that, I mean, one of the things I was trying to do in this book, but perhaps not very really successfully, was to suggest that 
even in something as conventional as religion, however conventionally you, you, you uh, interpret it, um, there is always an incipient dissent, even if it's just a dissent within the tradition of what do we do with this and what do we do with that and how do we organize this and how do we organize that. Nevertheless, there is that, that uh, in, incipient tradition. Uh, and I think that, that um, uh, the recognition of the, the, um, the potential of dissent in both the self and the other is very important. But that would be the next step to move to. There, there isn't a permanent self in a permanent other. Uh, there is this conflict that goes on in all these groups right the way through. The renouncer, yes, I think the renouncer is an absolutely fascinating category, and I've been fiddling around with the renouncer for many, many years now, um, trying to get a hang on to something, because I think that this is a very fundamental aspect of Indian civilization that we produced renouncers, what we did with the renouncers, what the renouncers did to us is something that still has to be understood. And there's been a tendency again to brush the renouncer underneath the carpet of the ascetic and to call the renouncer an ascetic as well, uh, which is not correct. I mean, the two are very distinct. Their purposes are very distinct. And the whole business of the commitment to society which the renouncer has. This is not a commitment that the ascetic has. The ascetic goes away and really is fundamentally unconcerned with the other human beings. He's concerned with his own liberation. Um, and anyway, when one, when one looks at this, um, the, 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 the uh, role of the renouncer, it's, it's very important to remember what was pointed out that the ethics of renunciation, the ethics that the renouncer takes upon himself or herself are really very fundamental. And this does make a lot of difference to what we call protest and what we call dissent, as I said earlier on. Ethics is absolutely crucial to dissent. And hence the link up with nonviolence, with compassion, with the love of humanity and so on. Um, in the shamanic tradition, in the tradition of the renouncer, as we know it in the in, in, in Indian civilization. Dissent is important to institutions. Dissent is also important to religion. Let's not forget that a lot of uh, philosophical theory would not have advanced in the way it has advanced without there being people who said, sorry, I don't agree. I, I, this is something I question, and I think that this is something that needs to be discussed further or it needs to be seen from a different point of view. So that even at the level of the non-institution in religion, there has been a fair amount of dissent. Again, the tendency is, uh, particularly for the self, to try and cover it over and say, no, no, this is not quite dissent. This is just, this is just a way, another way of looking at the same thing. You know, um, one believes in one God, but there are many ways in which people look at that one God, but they're all ultimately looking at the same God, um, which is nice as a slogan. But in fact, are we all looking at the same God? Don't we make a distinction? And in every religion, don't we make a distinction? It's not just uh, between religions, it's even within religions. And so I think that one of the things that I would like to see happen, which of course won't happen in my lifetime, is um, a much more, in a way, questioning study of what we have taken for granted as a study of religion. I mean, concepts of deity, concepts of worship, concepts of the relationship, bhakti, for example. For me, the most important thing about bhakti is the multiple ways in which the relationship between the individual and his or her deity are put together and are expressed. 
And I think this comparative study of these ways would be very, very revealing, uh, revealing both to Indian philosophy, to Indian society, revealing of the way people think. And I think would be very important ammunition, particularly these days, when religion has been converted into something completely different. It's completely new. It's the kind of thing we've never experienced before in this country. And I think it is, it's very essential that, that, you know, we talk about it and we ask for a discussion on it and we ask for an examination of what is, after all, not just something that goes by, by default. It's something that is essential and is becoming more and more central to our lives, uh, whether we want it to be or not. But anyway, that that is. Um, so I would argue that the understanding of dissent, and this was one reason why I ventured into this essay. I think that the one of the the uh, um, important ways is uh, to understand dissent is is crucial to understanding the present. And I come back to the quote that Simona gave uh, of E. H. Carr that it's perfectly true that we are, as historians, trying to understand ourselves in the present and understand the present. That's, that's uh, ex extremely crucial um, to, to our life today. I mean, to understand the pivotal role of dissent in both thought and in the making of institutions. After all, institutions also don't just come up on their own saying, um, uh, you know, supporting the self. The institutions also very often come up as dissenting groups getting together and organizing themselves. They may not remain that, they may change. Uh, but it's important to try and ask the question of what was the reason for this particular institution to come up? If you're going to start a monastic system, what is the reason for your doing so? If you're going to start convents of nuns, what is your reason for agreeing to do so? I mean, I think that um, after Ananda had persuaded Buddha that women should be allowed to become nuns and that there should be a nunnery in a convent and so on, somebody should have said to the Buddha, will you please explain to us why you think that you are agreeable to this idea. Because that's terribly important and is, is not um, terribly often discussed. Um, nationalism. This is uh, always a problematic thing these days, but anyway. Um, it is a coming together of citizens. I think so. You couldn't have nationalism without the awareness that there is a change in society, that people are no longer subjects, that they are citizens, that they're, 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 uh, they're free people. And it is particularly strong, I think, that if one takes at least the North Indian languages into consideration, the subject was called the praja, the child, the progeny of what? Of the kingdom, of the king, et cetera, et cetera. Um, people are not children. People are not progeny. People are free individuals, men and women. And therefore, the whole concept of citizenship, I think, is a very, very opposite concept for our times today. And not only opposite, it's absolutely essential. We cannot understand the change that's going on without realizing that we have to fundamentally change to understanding what is meant by citizenship and to becoming uh, citizens in that sense. Um, and apart from just being citizens, it's a relationship between the citizen and the state. Now, this is bringing in a new area of relationships. And the relationship between the subject was with the king and with the kingdom. Now you have a different category altogether, which is the state, the nation, not the government, 
the state, the nation. And this is a problem which comes up because people confuse it and they often talk about the relationship of the citizen to the government. No, it is a citizen to the state. And that implies what the two speakers were mentioning, the rights of the citizens, uh, which have to be guaranteed by the state. And this is the kind of situation in which a lot of dissent comes in. What are these rights? Does everybody agree on these rights? No, they don't agree. So therefore we have to argue them out, we have to discuss them, and finally we have to decide on what we think <coughs> are the appropriate rights. So I think that the whole question of nationalism, the legitimacy of dissent, of citizenship, of the new relationships that this is the nation state brings in, are very crucial and they are particularly crucial at a time where you have the possibility of the state taking shapes that one is not very anxious that the state should do, uh, to put it mildly. Um, therefore, yes, I think, um, I think you, you're absolutely right in saying that dissent also has, quite apart from what I said about nonviolence and passive resistance, all of which is very important. And I think it's going to be more and more important as we go along. The more we realize that there is a tradition of dissent in this country, that we are not a civilization that just suddenly sprang up and continued uncontested, that there is a tradition of dissent, the more important it will be to realize that one of the ways of expressing that dissent is precisely through passive resistance, and that we have to uh, not sit down necessarily and start sort of reciting verses from X, Y, and Z, but think this thing out ourselves in terms of what, shows, what form should this uh, new characterization of dissent in society take in order to bring about this society that in a sense the national movement was fighting for. Let me end with a little story. When I was in school, my last year of school was 1947. And we were approaching the 15th of August, 1947. And I was asked by the principal, uh, and she said to me, you know, there were five of us who were prefects or six of us who were prefects, I've forgotten. And she said, you know, as a prefect, I would like you on the 15th of August to, with the other prefects, to pull down the Union Jack, put up the Indian flag, plant a tree, and I want you to make a little speech. And I said, no, no, not me, please, not me. And she said, no, no. It's very nice, you make a little speech. And for two weeks before the 15th of August, I had sleepless nights because I didn't know what the hell I was going to say. There would be the whole school, there would be the parents, there would be people in specially invited, etc. It was, after all, Independence Day. So I crawled along to my history teacher, whom I was rather fond of, and I said, what do I speak about? And she said, it's very simple. I mean, you girls after school each day trot off to hear Gandhiji making his uh, speeches at prayer meetings. You discuss becoming free and independence and so on. Just talk about that. What is it that you want? So I sat down and I prepared this little speech and the two things that I focused on were, what is our identity as Indians now? Because once the British go away, we can't say that we are Indians because we're not British. We have to redefine ourselves and find an identity. And the second problem was, what kind of society do we want? We don't want the continuation of a colonial society. We want a different society. And so I spent my whatever it was, 10, 15 minutes talking a little bit about this and so on. And in a strange kind of way, I was thinking about this the other day, I seem to have spent my entire life. And I think all of us of my generation that grew up on the cusp of independence as 
young nationalists, all of us have spent our lives trying to find out what is our identity as Indians and what kind of society do we want to build. These are problems that are perennial, that will stay with us, will change as they go along, will not go away. And we have to be very, very aware of the kinds of answers that we want to give to these questions. Thank you. And thank you so much for your presentations. I'm really deeply, deeply touched. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Thapar. Um, there are actually two questions. Now, I'm not sure whether you want to take them. If you do not, that's perfectly fine. Um, but if you do, I will read them out. Yeah, I'll read them out and I'll see. All right. Uh, so uh, let's take them one after the, uh, I mean, uh, why don't you respond to one and then I'll read the second one out because the mm -hmm. second is quite long. Uh, the first is from uh, Sanil Mohan. He asks, um, it is related, his question is related to the problem of moral power. I think the question of moral power needs to be problematized to understand the history or histories of structural violence in India. You know, part of the answer to this is really, how do you define moral power? What exactly do you mean by moral power? Uh, morality doesn't lie only in politics geared to nonviolence. Moral morality comes into all kinds of politics, which don't necessarily require nonviolence, but which require moral attitudes. So I think <clears throat> it is always said, and I agree that, you know, um, if there's one area of life in which we have to insist on morality, it is, of course, a political life, because it's very important. It touches absolutely everybody from the, the topmost person to the lowest person, and morality is absolutely crucial. Um, but I'm really not very clear about uh, what the questioner means about the link between moral power and nonviolence. I'm sorry, I'm not dodging the question. I'm asking a counter question. Um, I think the, the specific wording is uh, that it needs to be problematized to understand the history of histories of structural violence in India. Oh, uh, yes, I think that it is necessary to, to do some studies of, yes, of uh, where violence has taken place and what that violence has been. I think that we've been uh, brought up for too long on this idea that uh, the essential feature of Indian civilization has been <clears throat> tolerance and nonviolence. This is not so. It's not been the essential feature of any civilization. And I would go a little further and say that where you have civilizations, you have areas of conflict, and you do occasionally end up with having areas of violence. And it becomes extremely necessary then to, to study these, to analyze these, and to ask yourself the question of, why does this violence take place? Try and find answers to do this. We cannot keep on dodging this question by saying, oh, we were always tolerant and we were always nonviolent. Um, the second uh, slightly long question is from Pankaja, uh, who says that the sex continue to mushroom in modern times, look at the Sai Baba cult and the Radha Swami cult. Do we not need to make a distinction between one, sex that ride big money, mega marketing, magnificence of architecture, but limited to purely uh, doctrinal, and two, sex that have a more socially subaltern and interventionist character. The latter is suppressed, but the former is celebrated. The former is politically complementary to the majoritarian cultivation of homogenous and communal identity defining citizenship. Um, 
uh, incredibly thought worthy? Can it be done by democratic consensus? Yeah, I mean, it is, um, when one talks about sects, one isn't suggesting that every sect is foolproof and above board, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the point that, that I was trying to make was that instead of seeing religion as a monolithic block, one sees it as juxtaposed sects. Now, even in sects, as in other groups, uh, there are categories. There are categories where you have uh, the teaching of a particular ethical notion becoming very, very important. And uh, there are others in which that is not so. And let's not forget that even, even in the broader religions, which are constituted of uh, multiple sects, like Buddhism, for example, the Buddha may have emphasized ethics and compassion to a very great degree. The question that the historian has to ask is, was this continued through in the history of other Buddhist sects, uh, the Mahayana, the Hinayana, the Vajrayana, and so on? Or did they go off into different directions? And did they incorporate nonviolence and a lack of compassion in some of their dealings? The, these are realities. These are the realities of life which have to be brought into a study. So yes, when you're, when you're evaluating a sect, you cannot evaluate it only in terms of religious teaching. You have to evaluate it in terms of who are its members, where do these people come from? What are they propagating? How are they propagating what they are propagating? What are the institutions that they are building? And how do these institutions affect society? There is a multiplicity of questions that you have to ask when you're talking about the history of any sect. And then the questions multiply when you're talking about the history of more than one sect. But yes, you do treat it as something that has to be analyzed. You cannot treat it as touch me not. It's, it's nothing in life is touch me not. Everything has to be analyzed. And it is the, the business of the historian to carry out this analysis. Uh, would either of the two discussants wish to add anything else or should we take this as the last word? I just want to um, really thank Professor Thapar for um, engaging with our comments and for sharing her thoughts um, in in, in the manner in which she did, which is, uh, you know, going back to her own um, childhood, making this also showing us what is at stake for her uh, personally, as well as what is at stake for an entire generation in, in posing these questions. So, um, uh, yeah, I don't really have anything to say. I just want to really thank you. And I, I have a request to make of uh, Anu, which is that I hope the, um, the Kerala Center will at some point make it possible for, for us to have that cup of coffee and conversation about this oh, book in you. person. <laughs> uh, because that, I think that is really what this book, a book of this kind demands, you know, much uh, more than these life. formal conversations, a kind of, um, yeah, uh, a sitting together and a chat. Yeah, so yeah. we must all rush off and have boosters and then settle down to a cup of coffee. <laughs> we must indeed. I wish life was different and I could say to you, which I would in a heartbeat, that you should come here and we could do yes. it. Yes, and I, I would come like a shot. I know. <laughs> you know no so wonderful. Any, um, any invitation from Kerala and I come. I'm, yeah, what to I do? used to come when I was traveling. <laughs> But we are living through such absurd and unbelievable times. It's unbelievable, yeah, absolutely. So um, it gives me enormous pleasure to thank Professor Romila Thapar, Dr. Simona Sani, and Dr. John Thomas.
for this wonderful mm -hmm. evening of thinking and meditating on dissent and different kinds of forms and idioms of dissent. Thank you so much. And thank you to an extremely patient audience. And uh, one of the people who asked a question pointed out to me that I clubbed her question with Pankaj's question. So my huge apologies, Pooja. Uh, but I think many of the kinds of issues that you were raising got addressed as part of the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.